Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we, we should get started now. Our, our opening uh, topical review is going to be provided by Carlo Cavallati. Um, he's he's a 100% a, a Milano man. He got his undergraduate degree at Milano, got his graduate degree at Milano, immediately started as an assistant professor and moved up the ranks and now a, a full professor there. Um, he did a postdoc at MIT. He has had a sabbatical at, actually at Argonne in, in, in our group. It's really great having him visit there. He, he's done a lot of things. Some of the things he's noteworthy for is doing a lot of work on, on PAH chemistry, looking at really complicated potential energy surfaces and also looking at non-adiabatic reactions, also where the potential surfaces are really complicated. And that's led him down the path of trying to, to find ways to do some of his calculations more efficiently. And he's developed some really nice, a really nice code, ES to KDP, to look not only at finding transition states, but, but getting accurate rate constants from once, you, once you've got the transition state. There's a lot more in getting an accurate rate constant than just finding the saddle point. And he's developed a really nice code for doing that. And so it gives him a, a great background for talking about what he's going to talk about here today. And he's just going to give a review of the whole field of trying to automate chemical kinetics uh, and telling us about the status and challenges. And Carlo? So thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. And uh, uh, thanks to the organizer for inviting me uh, to give this, uh, uh, this talk. That's really uh, an honor. I'm very happy to have uh, uh, the opportunity to present the status of this uh, very uh, active and rapidly evolving uh, uh, field, uh, which is the uh, automation of chemical kinetics. So uh, the uh, way I've organized my talk is mostly to introduce people who are not yet into this field or not uh, professionals into this field uh, to what we are doing, uh, me and my colleagues uh, uh, in this uh, effort in trying to automate chemical kinetics and <clears throat> trying to focus on uh, the main subjects and introducing these uh, about what are uh, challenges of where we are now. Uh, maybe I have not uh, been uh, Toraf uh, in making a list uh, of all the contributions, all the people who work in this field. Uh, so I apologize for that if you don't find your work cited, uh, but it is for sure, uh, I hope, cited and the paper that accompanies this uh, presentation, which is already out. So also for references uh, about uh, websites uh, or papers uh, about what I'm about to present, uh, you can uh, look at the paper. Uh, so. Uh, <coughs> I organized uh, my talk uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, five moments. I'm going to give you the motivation about why it's worthwhile uh, to automate chemical kinetics and what, what's uh, the perspective of how far we can go with automated chemical kinetics. And uh, uh, as you will see, uh, there are uh, three pillars on which automation rests, and that's uh, kinetic mechanism generation, determination of thermochemical parameters, and rate constant estimation. I will go uh, through uh, these three pillars to show you how far we have progressed on each one of them. Uh, then I want to dedicate some time about where our challenges in uh, this, uh, this field, and uh, uh, we'll come to the uh, conclusions. So um <coughs> why? Uh, why doing uh, automation in chemical kinetics? Well. Uh, for sure, there's been, and you may have noticed, a huge increase uh, uh, in the quality of the accuracy of theoretical prediction that can be done uh, through theoretical kinetics. So uh, energy barriers are below uh, 1 kcal mole if you apply uh, computational level that are what we call like heat-like methods. That was uh, unthinkable up to a few years ago. Uh, our RKM, master equation calculations, can now be done routinely and uh, up to uh, five, 10 years ago, that was not possible. And we have progressed so much in the uh, computation of uh, uh, rate constants uh, uh, 
uh, that if we apply the full theoretical power uh, and computational power that we have at disposal, uh, we can get to uh, below a factor or two, even for in prediction of rate constant, even for very complicated system. So uh, to, uh, to give uh, the proper copyright to Bill Green, uh, we may be in the stage where we're moving from uh, post-dictive to predictive kinetics, where post-dictive, uh, it's based uh, the kinetics on experimental evidence on which we uh, create our kinetic models, uh, estimate parameters, and uh, uh, fitting parameters of most sensitive reactions we get to rate constants, uh, which, however, requires uh, exter uh, extensive experimental campaigns. In predictive, it's like totally on the other side. Uh, we uh, build the kinetic mechanism uh, totally a priori, uh, from first principle, through, uh, from determination of a list of chemical reactions, as to estimation of thermochemical parameters and rate constants. So there are several problems in getting to that uh, level, uh, but uh, what's gonna uh, be the uh, final aim? What can we get out of this? Uh, well, uh, let's think about uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, trying to predict uh, the reactivity of uh, a new fuel uh, from scratch, so without doing uh, any experiment. Uh, it may be, for example, a new jet uh, engine fuel. Uh, can we do this theoretically? Where well, if we are successful, if this community is successful, uh, maybe we can get this point. So are we getting to a point where maybe experiments are not needed anymore? That, that actually was a question that was asked to me um, two days ago in an interview. And I, I'm gonna give you uh, the answer like at the last slide of this, uh, of this talk. So um, what uh, means uh, uh, to go to uh, predictive kinetics. Uh, that's, that's a scheme uh, of uh, things that need to be done uh, in order to build uh, these uh, kinetic mechanisms for any, let's say, new fuel that we want to uh, talk about. So uh, you have your reactive system and you start with uh, uh, the mechanism generation. So I, I don't have a pointer, so I will guide you th through the slide, hoping you can follow uh, how I I go from one subject to the other. So step one, pillar one, uh, mechanism generation. It's a list of chemical species and a list of reactions. So we have uh, left and right columns, and once you have the list of chemical species, once you have built uh, the uh, kinetic mechanism, you need to determine the thermochemical and transfer parameters for all the species. And that, uh, it's, uh, uh, let's say that the first thing, one, one of the key things that we will look at to this presentation. Uh, once you have thermochemical and transfer parameter for all the species, you can look at the reaction list and determine rate constant for uh, all the reactions that you have identified as being present into your mechanism. Uh, you take these three pillars together, uh, you have your kinetic mechanism with uh, transport and thermochemical parameters, and you can do your kinetic simulation and see if you agree or not with the uh, uh, experiment. Uh, if yes, fine, otherwise we can try to go back and do some uh, iteration. Now, uh, let's look at the beginning of this three pillar, kinetic mechanism generation. Uh, how can we do it? So uh, I've listed the two uh, possible approaches. Uh, the first approach is like um, what we have right now. It's what I call uh, uh, incremental. Uh, we have uh, a core mechanism uh, for which uh, uh, we have developed rate right constant high level of theory for uh, all reactions that are there. Uh, and then we add uh, uh, new chemistry for each unknown species that we want to include in the model. Or uh, what may be the dream, we go fully theoretically. We, we don't start from available knowledge. Uh, we uh, just create the mechanism from uh, seed species, added species, and uh, created ad hoc mechanism for each temperature and pressure uh, conditions that we want to simulate. Now let's start from uh, this uh, um, <coughs> second approach that's been uh, pioneered by the group of Bill Green, though there are other approaches to build kinetic mechanism, and uh, actually maybe the, the uh, first uh, model where uh, a kinetic mechanism was built uh, uh, just uh, theoretically through a set of algorithms was the MAMOX code that was uh, uh, built in a Politecnico like 40, 50 years ago. 
uh, but then in the last 20 years, uh, uh, RMG uh, that's described here has progressed uh, uh, so much that it's kind of the reference for building kinetic mechanism automatically. So uh, according to this uh, approach, you start from some core species, maybe they are our reactants, uh, you look at the reaction they can have, uh, you have the generation of other species, you enlarge your mechanism, you include the new reaction, and you go on uh, building the kinetic mechanism uh, uh, through this approach. At present, this approach is implemented by using uh, rate constant <coughs> estimated through reaction classes. So it requires uh, a, an uh, estimation of uh, uh, rate constant through rate rules, essentially. Um, though on the fly calculations can be possible. So um, is this science fiction? No, because uh, already we have some examples of the application of these uh, uh, methodology. Uh, so, for example, this is how um, the uh, properties of uh, on ignition delay times uh, of substituted phenols uh, had on a uh, reactive mixtures. Uh, and uh, you see uh, the mechanism was built with RMG. Uh, that there is definitely correlation between uh, predicted uh, delta ignition delay times and. Uh, uh, experimental data, it's not perfect, uh, but qualitatively it's fine, which is uh, uh, very, uh, very important for uh, a mechanism that's built from uh, first principle. Um, so what are the issues uh, with uh, uh, construction uh, through a priori method uh, of a chemical mechanism? That, well, that's what we uh, call as a feedback. So maybe some uh, species are formed in a small concentration, but then they have a huge impact on the reactivity of the whole mechanism. And so uh, it's uh, difficult to uh, define a threshold at which cutting uh, the number of species that you have you to include in the mechanism. And that's a very sensitive parameter because if you keep the threshold uh, too high, uh, then the mechanism explodes. If it is too low, you're missing some key chemistry. Uh, then you need uh, um, to have an accurate way of estimating rate constant for uh, all species, including the mechanism, which is, uh, may not be easy uh, if uh, you combine some very exotic species reactivity. Uh, and then there is uh, this uh, big issue that's called the truncation error. Uh, what if uh, some reaction pluses uh, are not present into your uh, mechanism that you have constructed uh, a priori? And, and that's a big question. Uh, Getting back to the incremental approach, uh, which, which I'm more confident because I've worked on that. Uh, so there are already several core mechanisms present in the literature. So you can think about the crack, the nuke mechanism, the Livermore, and many others. You shall first uh, do know uh, more about me. So these models have a predictive capability that has progressed greatly in the last year, thanks also to uh, ab initio approaches. Um, so how, how does it work when uh, you have the incremental approach you want to add a new species? Uh, that's, for example, what we do when we included acetic acid reactivity in our model. So uh, you say we have a core mechanism, we want to look at uh, acetic acid reactivity. So you start from the molecule and you look first of all at the pyrolysis, so the composition reactions. Uh, that's the potential energy surface we investigated for this system and we determine uh, rate constant for both uh, this potential energy surface and for uh, abstraction reaction. Um, at the time, uh, we were training our code, so it was not fully automatic. Now we can do most of these reaction essentially in an automatic way. Um, <coughs> so uh, that's you, what you get uh, out of the model. You have potential energy surface, some comparison with experimental data for the composition rate, and then you uh, end up making some simulations. Uh, so uh, what's uh, interesting about that, the point that I want to make, is that um, <clears throat> in developing this mechanism, uh, you can take advantage of sensitivity analysis. So maybe there are some reactions that you identified that have large uncertainties. And uh, uh, once you uh, learn about which are these reactions, you can work on them and uh, uh, enhance your uh, level of theoretical investigation, which is what we did. Uh, the other thing that uh, it's interesting to point out about this slide is that uh, we uh, increased with our, this model uh, our, the quality of our prediction of uh, the laminar flay speed, but we are not yet perfect. 
So uh, this system has been re-examined also by other authors. Uh, what we believe, not only me, but also other in the literature, is that some chemistry is missing uh, and to describe the reactivity of acetic acid. And so we got back, uh, get back to what I said before, that that's a truncation error. So how do we discover new chemistry for this system? That's a big question. And uh, there's something we can do about that, uh, but that's, uh, <coughs> that's really where uh, we need to make uh, progress. So uh, what can we say about the incremental approach? Uh, it's uh, uh, systematic and you build knowledge and you build on the knowledge that you created by studying new system. So in the crack mechanism, for example, every new system is stored as a separate uh, batch of uh, uh, reaction that they can be inserted in the mechanism as you uh, study different system with different properties. Uh, disadvantage, well, clearly you're seeing that there is some human intervention. Mostly you need to think about what to add, what to study. Uh, it can be systematized, but up to a certain level. Uh, again, uh, truncation error, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a big question for this system. And uh, uh, there must be some uh, automation of the uh, rate constant calculations. Now, um, let's go to uh, the second pillar. So first pillar was building of kinetic mechanism. Um, now, uh, let's assume we have built our kinetic mechanism. How do we estimate uh, thermochemical parameters? That's where we have made uh, most progress in uh, uh, the last year. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, slide that's already grown a bit uh, old, I guess, but I like this one. It was uh, uh, from the PAC chem approach that then became the uh, AutoMec uh, um, system uh, methodology. Uh, to determine thermochemical and rate constant parameters. Uh, it gives you an idea that uh, you bring uh, uh, different software together with different capabilities in order to uh, construct uh, uh, the information you need to get to the determination of the thermochemical parameters. Uh, then we have uh, the RMRG approach. Again, also here, uh, you see uh, there are uh, different approaches combining RD kit ASE uh, different software from different developers that are combined to get to uh, the construction of the information you need to uh, eventually to determine thermochemical parameters. Here there is uh, uh, another example by another colleague, uh, Professor Barone, uh, who uh, developed a methodology focused on the study of a conformational analysis. So rather than uh, focusing on the details of each one of these different approaches, it's uh, <coughs> Nice to see that there is a pattern evolving about how uh, to construct uh, a system of uh, uh, automatically determined thermochemical parameters for a huge list of chemical uh, species. So there is a part where you use chem informatics, and that's where you transform uh, inches, for example, information to uh, X, Y, Z geometries, and you perform um, then you go to electronic structure calculation. You can perform it also with the chemi informatics, but uh, the issue here is to try to determine, uh, to perform a conformational sampling of all uh, the possible structure of your uh, molecules. That, that's very important, this conformational sampling. It's important that you refer when you study a molecule uh, that you know which is the lowest energy structure and then um, what are the possible isomers of energy similar uh, to this lowest energy. So this sampling of the potential energy surface, uh, it's very important at the beginning. And then you determine, uh, need to determine energies uh, at a proper level of theory. So that's what we call high level energies. Uh, followed by uh, this approach, there's some uh, final uh, step that's related to account for uh, correction for anharmonicities if you want to determine proper thermochemical parameters, and that's where there is uh, uh, research going on in order to account for these properly. And then uh, you can finally, I mean, do all this information determine uh, enthalpies, entropies, and heat capacities. Now, uh, going to conformational sampling, uh, that's also kind of a, a standardized approach. Uh, the way we have implemented, but many others have implemented in the same way. Uh, you uh, find the uh, torsional dihedral angles that are responsible for uh, going from one structure to another. There are automated ways of automatically determining uh, which are the dihedral angles within a molecule. Uh, then uh, you construct uh, what we call a Z matrix, so it's a, 
representation that can be used as an input for uh, a, an electronic structure calculation. And then you perform uh, a random sampling. Generally, you do a random sampling on all the possible dihedral angles. Uh, what's the point with, the, uh, with this random sampling? Is that the number of points to consider can be large, and the number of structure you can find can be very large. So for uh, dodecane, we can talk about 20,000 uh, different electronic structure calculation for optimization. And there are some uh, motion, internal motion, leading to different structures, such as umbrella or packering uh, motions that are uh, kind of difficult uh, to describe in this conformational sampling. Uh, then talking about high-level energies, I really like uh, the, the, the paper that was published uh, recently by the Kevin Van Geem group. Um, so uh, as long as the molecule is small enough, you uh, can apply what's known as the golden standard of electronic structure calculation that's a couple uh, cluster theory, um, but uh, it scales uh, uh, terribly with the dimension of uh, the system that you're treating. So you need to uh, solve this problem of having high accurate energy for large system. So um, it is possible when you start building a large network of uh, um, thermochemical parameters for chemical species and the type of uh, um, databases that we have contain uh, tens of thousands uh, of chemical species. So there is a lot of information there and this information can be harvested in order to get rules uh, uh, that can be fed uh, to artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithm uh, to simplify this step of proceeding uh, in uh, increasing our accuracy in inter for the estimation of high level energies. So that's where you can uh, really harvest uh, this data. And I, I guess many of uh, the groups that are active now in uh, uh, automating chemical kinetics are really focusing uh, on the construction of these databases where uh, the information is very important. Um, now, uh, last one of this step in the determination of thermochemical parameters is to account for harmonicities. So as long as you stay in the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator approximation, uh, determination of thermochemical parameter is standard. Uh, but you need to be careful because uh, there are internal motion and they need to be uh, determined uh, properly. So as long as we are talking about torsions, uh, there are methods that work nicely uh, to describe uh, and to correct for uh, thermochemical parameters uh, related to this type of internal motions. It gets more complicated where you have uh, harmonic cities related to umbrella and packering motions. Uh, there, uh, to account for these can be uh, relevant and uh, this correction for an harmonic uh, uh, behavior can be very relevant at high temperatures uh, where combustion is uh, and where not many thermochemical data are available. Uh, so that's something that we really need to consider properly. Uh, open issues is also <coughs> when the indirect rotors are coupled, so when you have uh, multiple torsion inside the molecule that interact one with the other, so what we call multidimensional indirect rotor, and if you go to very large molecules, that can really become uh, an issue. There are existing models, such as MS Tor, that can be account for these type of motions, but they are, uh, let's say, tested uh, in uh, real combustion condition only up to a certain uh, level. And uh, yeah, as I was saying, when we were doing the conformational analysis, uh, you can come up finding uh, thousands of conformers and uh, really need to find a way of uh, being synthetic to account to uh, of how, understanding how they contribute to the global system reactivity. Uh, because uh, then for a single molecule, you need to consider uh, 10,000 of uh, different species. Well, that, uh, that really gets into trouble, just also for managing uh, the data associated to that. Then the last pillar, it's a uh, great <coughs> constant estimation. So <coughs> that's uh, the methodology uh, that's been used now for some time for estimating rate constants. It's called um, ab initio uh, transition state theory master equation method. It requires uh, several steps uh, in order to get to rate constant estimation. First of all, uh, you need to know your potential energy surface. Uh, which can be a multi-well potential energy surface and which requires some method to be explored. Uh, then you need to determine uh, parameters for the stationary point of this potential energy surface. And uh, if you stop at the RRHO approximation, then you're done. Uh, but uh, if you want to get really accurate to this factor of two I was talking about, you need to include uh, corrections for 
many things, such as conformational analysis and harmonicities, high level energy, symmetry, and uh, reaction, intrinsic reaction coordinate analysis. So uh, that's important. It requires a lot of work, and that's part of the reason why you want to do automation, not only uh, to have uh, large sets of rate constant, but also to uh, get these steps done uh, rapidly and without too much human intervention. That, well, being uh, also heavy on the human side, uh, it's also uh, the, one of the main source of errors that we see in this type of calculations. Uh, once you have all this data, you can go to uh, the last two steps that are the rate constant estimation. Uh, mostly we use transition state theory, which can be quite accurate for most of the system that we want to, to study and then estimate rate constant, which usually uh, now adopt master equation simulation to determine the rates. So let's start from the first step, the potential energy surface in investigation. Um, there are several codes out, uh, so Kimboat, uh, GSM method of Dipperman, uh, Parinello is doing some nice work uh, using metadynamics, uh, Afir from Morokuman co workers, other codes are uh, definitely available. Um, so what's nice about this uh, use of automatic system of investigating potential energy surface is that's probably the way to follow if we want to discover new chemistry. They are unbiased. Uh, so uh, in principle, uh, they can tell you new reaction routes that you hadn't thought about through chemical intuition. Um, the status is that we, I can't give you an example of some uh, new discovery, a very important reaction route through uh, automatic potential energy surface uh, investigation, but for sure, uh, by revising some system with this methodology, we find errors that we have done in the exploration of these systems. So uh, that's an example of what it means to do an automatic potential energy surface investigation with the Kimbot. That's a code that developed by Judith Zahler. So uh, what you see, you start from uh, the gamma valero lacton uh, uh, intermediate, and then you search for all the possible uh, pathways connecting to isomers. So that's just the starting well. So think about uh, doing this for the testing one, getting to the isomer and the products, and then uh, you move to the wells, you have accept to, uh, access to isomerization, and you restart the process. And you go on like that, and uh, what happens is that with the uh, key mode approach, you can uh, come up uh, with uh, uh, potential energy surfaces that are really huge, really large, with a uh, uh, really big number of uh, uh, chemical reactions. But uh, you can really, uh, Kimbot can really give you, and there are evidences uh, about pathways discovered uh, uh, that you hadn't uh, really thought about before. Uh, once you have explored the potential energy surface, let's say that we have done this properly, uh, we need to determine uh, rate constants. So uh, the way we have uh, organized this step is to classify rate constant as a function of the reaction class. For each reaction class, uh, we have uh, different methodologies to estimate the rate. So abstractions are like kind of uh, the starting point for any automated con code in determining uh, rate constant, determining rate constant. Then you go up in the order of complexity to addition, uh, beta scission, isomerization, uh, ipso substitution, elimination. Uh, here uh, we have uh, uh, all of it uh, already implemented in our codes. Uh, and uh, we're working on radical, radical abstraction and barrier recombination. And that's where you go to the highest complexity. And there we are not yet fully uh, automated, but we are near. Um, so what's interesting is most uh, of this complexity of automating this calculation is related to when you have a strong multi-reference character of uh, uh, the transition state of all the reactants. Multi-reference, uh, uh, means that you have uh, two electronic structures that are similar in energies, uh, but different in nature. And uh, uh, when this is the case, uh, um, where are we? Okay. Uh, when this is the case, you need uh, uh, to have some approaches, uh, quantum chemistry approaches that are not black box. Multi-reference approaches uh, uh, require definitely human intervention, and we are spending a lot of time in order to get rid of this human intervention. That, that's kind of, uh, for us, uh, uh, the biggest problem we have at the moment. Um, now, uh, that's an example of how we have uh, parameterized uh, rate constant estimation. Um, in uh, our code that tests to KTP, this code is available for free download. Um, there are other codes that can do similar stuff. 
so we go from uh, conformational analysis uh, to determination of transition state, uh, estimation of uh, um, a different level of theories of structure and frequencies of reactants, uh, uh, determination of high-level energies up to the determination of the master equation. That's all by modules. So you can decide which module to shift, sw uh, switch on uh, in order to have uh, your uh, approach to the determination of rate constant. So these, uh, for example, for abstraction are the type of uh, modules that we have implemented that go from the standard rigid rotor harmonic oscillator approximation up to uh, the rigid rotor plus 1D hindered rotor approximation that's usually implemented and used for uh, most uh, theoretical calculation. Uh, but we have also some uh, nice uh, uh, theoretical level implemented in our code and we keep updating, going up from time to time. So we can do uh, VRC, uh, VTST calculation in internal coordinates, uh, which is uh, only possible also with a poly rate, but it's not automated. Um, and we can do uh, multidimensional hindered rotors that are coupled up, let's say, to three coupled uh, hindered rotors, that thanks to the interface with the codes written by Yuri Georgeski. So that's an example of conformational analysis we did for uh, this abstraction channel uh, from, uh, um, from this ester uh, from the methyl group. Um, you see uh, on the right, you have the potential energy surface that's been determined in two dimension, and that's a, a calculation of the uh, density of states for this 2D motion that's assumed to be uh, fully coupled at the transition state, which is something uh, not so uh, straightforward to do. We have uh, the projector of indirect rotor from the Hessian that is automated following a method that was uh, pioneered by uh, Bill Green. So, uh, what, what um, happens after you have done all this investigation that you end up with uh, um, a large master equation that's been investigating with a large number of chemical species, intermediate wells that maybe are not stable in some uh, temperature and pressure ranges, and uh, many reactions that you don't want in your kinetic mechanism. So uh, after having gone down so much into the details of your system, you need to do some things like this. So make some step back and get to um, some let's say, um, simplified uh, or um, system of a chemical reaction that, are, uh, that contain only the chemical species that really do exist in the temperature range that we are interested. So we have introduced this, uh, uh, Luna has done this work, Luna Pratali and Maffei, this master equation lumping concept. You can think, uh, looking at the upper side of the slide, uh, to have uh, uh, so uh, all the wells interconnected by all these uh, uh, possible pathways, that's uh, if you will, what you should, should do if you want to have phenomenological rate constants. And what we do is we simplify uh, this uh, uh, complex approach to just have some species, uh, maybe merged through some assumption of thermochemical equilibrium and some selected uh, uh, rates uh, uh, that are representative of the interconvention between these species. But this is done by uh, fitting over uh, the um, experimental, well, let's say, theoretical high-level uh, data. So we still retain consistency uh, with the result of the master equation simulations. Now, getting to the last part of my talk, uh, wh what remains to be done? W what are the challenges that we are facing at present? So uh, one big issue that we have now uh, in the kinetics literature is to uh, determine uh, systematically and fast uh, rate constant for barrierless reactions. Uh, it's always uh, a complication. For example, in this potential energy surface we investigated, uh, there are uh, six, seven uh, rate constants that, uh, that require passing through um, a barrierless uh, uh, channel. So uh, why is uh, determining rate constant for barrierless process uh, a problem? Well, uh, this picture tells you that uh, uh, when you go from a reactant to a product configuration, um, breaking a single bond, uh, essentially, you go from uh, two electrons within one orbital to two electrons in two separate orbitals. And in between, uh, you pass through a situation where you have a singlet radical uh, potential energy surface. In this situation, if you want to describe properly what's going on in your system, you need a multi-reference methodology. The standard single reference electronic structure methodologies are not sufficient to describe this properly. Uh, in addition, <coughs> let's say if you're if you, able to describe this properly, 
uh, through uh, variational transition state theory, uh, as you are breaking apart two molecules, uh, you have what are called uh, large amplitude motions, that to say that the relative motions of the two fragments are really inhibited or limited by very small barrier. So the harmonic oscillator approximation is not really working, and you need to account for the calculation of the density of states properly. So this is done uh, through VRC-TST theory, uh, where you essentially you are doing a 6D integration uh, of the transitional degrees of freedom that are the six degrees of freedom picture over there, uh, and uh, you use this integration to uh, compute the uh, density of state along the uh, reaction potential energy surface. So the number of steps that are necessary uh, to apply VRC TST is many. Uh, there's uh, uh, really you need to study your potential energy surface, uh, get up uh, with some uh, high quality uh, correction potentials, um, and finally you can perform uh, your uh, uh, six-dimensional integration. Uh, the, the, we have written our code to do this. We can do, uh, we have done the calculation uh, for this system, uh, for these uh, six, seven channels in uh, uh, two, three weeks, which is kind of uh, uh, very fast for doing VRC TST calculation. Um, the code is available, so, uh, but it requires some, uh, uh, some attention to, to, to be used, some instruction probably. Uh, is it worthwhile? Well, uh, I think so. Uh, the beauty of VRC TST theory is that if you apply it properly, uh, you can get to prediction rate constant in beautiful agreement with experiments. So that's the latest calculation I've done. That's CN uh, adding to 13 butadiene. And you see we have a rate constant going from 1000K uh, to 50K. At 50K still we are able to follow uh, the behavior of this system uh, quite nicely. Uh, also, kind of describing the maximum that we have in the rate constant at uh, 200K. And uh, uh, that's really a uh, fully ab initio calculation. So again, main problem, selection of active space for this system. When you have, uh, in addition, the CN radical, uh, you must be careful about that. So, <clears throat> other system, where there's a big talk about uh, going from the uh, one-dimensional to the two-dimensional master equation. Uh, wh why do we need a two-dimensional master equation? Mostly, uh, these are uh, the two forms of the 1D and the 2D master equation because of these uh, P, E, E first, or P, E, J, E first, J first. Uh, that to say the probability of uh, um, going from a certain E, J level to another E first, J first levels. So uh, if you want to describe this uh, uh, properly, uh, so properly I mean through an um, appropriate theoretical level, uh, then the collisional kernel, as we call this, uh, that's uh, how you go from a certain energy momentum level to another energy momentum level through collisions, uh, then this collisional kernel uh, must be described in uh, two dimensions. So must both E and J must be considered. Uh, while all, uh, present implemented uh, master equation model are one dimensional. So you just have uh, a jump from a certain energy level to another energy level. So if we want to have theoretical methodologies to account for uh, the um, intermolecular energy transfer, uh, we need uh, to move to the 2D uh, master equation. For all system, well, not for all. Uh, for some system, any E model may be sufficient, uh, but for uh, some other it may not be. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, <coughs> parameters are now available. Uh, that's, uh, well, that's a nice paper over there from uh, the, the reference from Aaron Jasper and Stephen Klippens that was published on science uh, a few years ago, uh, introducing the possibility of having these parameters estimated from a priori methods. And uh, uh, that's how the parameters were determined, delta E, delta EJ, uh, delta J as an average values. Uh, there are still some things to be done here, such as the collisional kernel, the PEJ uh, kernel need to be uh, determined at a um, proper uh, level of uh, theory. Or rather, th this type of uh, description of this collisional kernel is still not fully theoretical based. Let's say we can do something better, I believe. There are also questions, such as what are the collisional parameters for strong colliders, such as water and CO2. And you know, uh, this field is evolving so rapidly 
that I wrote this question like uh, in, uh, in, uh, in February where I was uh, preparing my review. And then in June, uh, Arin has published the data for some system for water and uh, uh, CO2. Uh, so some parameters are already available and they're really what we need to progress. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's going on what we are learning in this field and uh, uh, we see a moment where we will be able to describe through master equation properly the multi-collider effects. <coughs> Third system that is complicated, it's a radical-radical abstraction for who were in the uh, kinetic session before, you already have seen that. Uh, so what I want to uh, uh, tell you, uh, the message I want to convey you about this, uh, uh, this system is that, yeah, we are good at estimating energy barriers, there are ways of uh, correcting for uncertainties, uh, but there are systems that are really resilient to uh, an accurate calculation of the energy barrier. So, uh, for example, uh, the first table reports the energy barrier computed through what would be the standard approach. So I got to these values uh, by doing this calculation in like uh, one day, all four values uh, in automatically with uh, not much effort from me. Uh, but uh, these values are not really accurate because the T1 diagnosis is very high. So uh, to determine that accurately, it took like two months of work uh, in order to determine the proper active space to understand what was working or what was not working. And uh, uh, only when I had two different approaches that were given to similar results, I started to believe to these numbers. But still the uncertainty of these numbers, if you compare uh, the data calculated con, uh, with uh, approach A and approach B, uh, they have at least a 1K Kalmol uh, uncertainty if we are uh, let's say positive about that. So uh, let's get to what is uh, uh, like uh, uh, the last slide of uh, uh, my presentation. And that's uh, uh, what, uh, if we account for, uh, let's say one kcal mole, a factor of two uncertainty on these uh, uh, parameters. Well, we, we do see that if we try to simulate ignition delay time, uh, times with a factor of two uncertainties, we can have uh, like a factor of 10 uncertainty the ignition delay times. So uh, getting back to the question I was asking at the beginning of the presentation, it's go there gonna be a moment where we will not be need experiment anymore and we can do everything uh, through, through theory? Uh, I guess the answer is no. Uh, and the answer is then what's gonna be the role of experiment in uh, uh, developing theoretical models. Well, my idea is that the role of experiment is try to be synergic with the type of effort we're putting in determining rate constant calculation. There are situation uh, rates uh, system for which we have huge uncertainty and where a theoretical uh, estimation of some parameters or maybe some ignition delay times in this case would be hugely informative for us in uh, decreasing the uncertainty of what we are calculating. So if we progress through this synergy with the theory and experiment, with experiment focus on where we identified that we can't go deeper than a certain level, then would, uh, uh, I think that would be the, the perfect way of proceeding together. So the answer is, can we go without experiment? Well, it's no. Uh, we definitely still need uh, experiment to uh, improve our model. But we can do a lot without them. And we can complement uh, experiment where they are difficult to be done. Uh, so, uh, that's getting me to my uh, conclusions. Uh, so, I hope I uh, convey to you the fact that this is a rapidly growing field and there where we are making uh, huge processes day, day by day, really, day by day. Uh, automatic thermochemistry, it's there. So, if you uh, want to determine thermochemical parameters for some system that you're studying, look at the software that is available online because it can really help you. And uh, much of this software can be downloaded uh, and for most of it, there are also manuals which can help. Not, I think not for everything. Um, accuracy can be high, though uh, anharmonicity is uh, something where we need to work on. Uh, automated rate constant estimation, where are we? Uh, well, so several reaction classes, we, we know what to do. So for abstractions, as long as they are not some specific type of abstractions, uh, we can determine rate constant. That's good because in combustion, abstractions are very important processes. Um, challenges are mostly related to multi-reference aspects of some 
uh, reactions. Uh, some challenges mostly in automation uh, because we can solve the multi-reference uh, if there is human intervention. But there is hope. Uh, nowadays there are codes being developed that uh, do allow to use incredibly huge active space, such as the DMRG methodology. Uh, maybe this can help us to solve this issue. Um, for automated rate constant estimation, several codes are available. So we have uh, Arcane, AutoMec, AutoTST, S2KTP, Genesis, Kimbot. They all uh, can get you to a rate, uh, um, and they are uh, almost all available for uh, download. Uh, automatically generate the kinetic mechanism, it is possible, uh, but uh, then you end up with a huge list of chemical reactions. So uh, trying to uh, reconcile, reconcile the a large number of reactions to treat uh, with uh, uh, what can be done uh, even with huge computational power, that's still an issue to, uh, to address. Okay, with this, uh, I'm finished. Thank you for listening and being here. I'm happy to answer questions. I can repeat the question. No, okay, it's fine. Now, now it is. Okay. Really a superb coverage. Uh, I guess we should. Bill Westmoreland, North Carolina State. Uh, love the coverage, and I think it, it illustrates why gas kinetics is such a, such a powerful tool for understanding kinetics itself. I'd like to reflect on the opposite of this, though, not the automated, but the the stochastic sort of approach, in particular uh, the reactive molecular dynamics approach. Mm -hmm. That's the ideal and it's terrible. It's a horrible situation because there's so many non-reactive things that happen that you lose a lot of time. And yet, the reaction MD method that we developed, uh, Van Duyn's Reacts FF, they begin to make discoveries that becomes a problem of, of automating how you extract information from that, as well as cope with really large systems. But for combustion, we have to worry about condensed phase systems as well. Even if the combustion happens mostly in the gas phase, polymers, biomass decomposes to molecules. So we have to deal with that problem too. So the broader question I'm really posing is how do you see the reactive molecular dynamics type approach, as complicated and messy as it is, how is it complementary to what you're talking about as much opposite in intent? The objective is to come up with truly predictive, complete mechanisms anticipating what actually happens. Would you have any comment on that? Yeah. So uh, co concerning the um, reactive molecular, it's the reactive molecular dynamics you're thinking about, something like the reacts FF approaches. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the idea is to go to fully dynamics uh, in order to explore the reactivity of the system. Um, so I think that uh, by, uh, well, it needs to be accelerated, of course, in some way or another. Uh, if you do a dynamics a certain temperature, it has a time step. Uh, if you want to uh, simulate something taking place in a uh, uh, time that's consistent with your computer system, uh, then you need to uh, give some bias uh, to it uh, as it is done uh, with uh, the metadynamics approach, for example, and that's, uh, that, that's, that's interesting, but then you have the problem of recovering the true rate constant, which is not solved, though there are approaches uh, such as the Tiwari approach uh, uh, to, to recover uh, from in the, the rate constant from infrequent ev events. Uh, so I think it can be useful as a tool uh, to investigate the potential energy surface. That, that's my, uh, my, my idea, that is my opinion. Uh, it can complement some, some other approaches uh, uh, that we have presented uh, uh, today. Uh, my main uh, uh, feeling about uh, being cautious uh, uh, about this type of approaches is that we spend a lot of time in trying to get very accurate energies. And we see that these like uh, the, the key parameters uh, to get properly the energy barrier uh, to, to study chemical kinetics. And uh, uh, to be able to simplify the estimation of this accurate energy through a force field, 
I don't know how, how much you can, you can do that. Uh, it's fine for estimation, for, for mapping the potential energy surface. So then I would feel safer once I have mapped the potential energy surfa surface through these methodologies to fall back on some approaches where I have a better feeling of uh, uh, how accurate can be the energy barrier I determine through, through my approaches. So that's, that's my idea. So let's try from here. Uh, Katharina Kose, Bielefeld University. Beautiful talk, Carlo. Thank and you. forgive my questions of ignorance here. So I'm interested in the, let's say, developments of similar methodology in two or three other dimensions. So one of them is the flame synthesis, where you would have transition state metals or so, for example. So is that going to be a problem, or do you just you know, do the same thing as before? Um, then excited states, like in chemiluminescence or predicting absorption coefficients or so. And then we've seen a lot of plasma this week. And uh, how about, let's say, charged species? Can we okay. expect something similar for them? So thank you. OK. Yeah, well, th these are uh, all, uh, I should have put them in the list of challenges, <laughs> because uh, these are uh, uh, all complicated system. So uh, to look at the uh, flame synthesis, uh, uh, it's like looking at uh, the soot problem, right? Uh, how are we able to describe uh, soot nucleation and maybe inception? Um, that's, uh, uh, well, we are trying to do something, you know, by, by looking at the reactivity of uh, uh, chemical species leading to the growth of pH. And the idea is to try to come up with uh, some rate rules that can help us to scale uh, up the processes. Uh, but probably you need to, to revamp uh, uh, these approaches uh, so that they're focused on the description of the uh, growth uh, of the particle uh, in the gas. I think it is possible. Uh, I think it is uh, interesting to try to do, uh, but uh, uh, to do it with on the fly a initial estimation of chemical parameters, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated right now. And uh, um, the, the second question was on excited states. Uh, so um, I've done uh, some work on uh, um, <coughs> non adiabatic reactions, and uh, my code can uh, look uh, at uh, interstitial crossing within different potential energy surface. So on these, uh, uh, we can do that. And we have also implemented the methodologies uh, to find crossing between potential energy surfaces. Uh, so for internal conversion between different excited states, there are possibility to look into that. Um, uh, yeah, it would be like uh, looking at photochemistry. And that's something that has always uh, uh, kind of scare me. <laughs> now, I, I, we, we do have some methodologies that can be applied to that. I, we, we need to, to rethink uh, uh, the, the approach uh, and to recalibrate it in order, well, it would be like uh, determining a set of chemical species that would be now excited and uh, to find the reactions between different excited species to see if uh, one can uh, convert into the other. And that, that's something that can be uh, thought of. Yeah, it would be, it would be interesting. And uh, uh, the last one, the last system. Ions. Ah, ions, yeah. Um, we, can, we can do uh, ions. Um, uh, probably we will need to implement some new reaction class dedicated just to uh, look at the reactivity of ions. But it, let's say it's uh, within the uh, framework of what we are uh, trying to do so, so ions, I think it's uh, it's possible. Um, well, la, 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 just uh, w one week ago, I was asked by, by a company to do uh, some simulation for them, and they were going even more complicated than you are because they were looking at the reactivity of ions uh, with radicals in solution. So you see, there's no limit to the complication you can put <laughs> into, into the system. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to to. Raise a point. You had a nice list here of these different codes available uh, on your list, and there's actually more codes than this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, a, I think a big points. challenge for us, for the community, is to try to pull together firm toolkits, computational yeah. toolkits, of the parts that we think we really know how to do correctly and codify them. I think that the quantum chemists did a great job with that. So there's a couple packages of quantum chemistry that we all rely on. 
I think that the computational chemists, the computational kineticists have to do the same kind of thing to get codes that are firmly established. This is how you do it. Maybe there's two or three packages, but that's all. Because how are we going to maintain all the software? I think that right now we have like some heroic groups, like your group, my group. There's a few groups, uh, Steven's group, that are making packages. True Large group did it. But it, it, we're, we don't, we're not companies. We're not really set up to maintain software that thousands of people are using. So I think we have to figure out how are we going to organize ourselves so we can have that done. And then we can focus on the new things, like the electronically excited states and the, all the problems that we really have to work on that are kind of science problems beyond the automation steps. I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. But, but it is also, yeah, we, we should sit down and think about how to do that. Uh, one aspect about these codes is that uh, they are built to treat uh, uh, thousands, ten dozen, uh, hundreds of thousands of chemical species, uh, and uh, they have grown to a point of sophistication uh, that really it's so easy to put an error into them and get them in trouble. Uh, to get one code to talk to the other or to just perform one action independently of the other, th that's, that's really complicated. I think that's the reason why the codes are developed independently, because each one uh, has, has this, his own idea about how to interact with uh, all the different steps that must be done. But then once it is implemented, uh, to merge it with some other code, it's, uh, it's difficult. So w we should think about some way, though I totally agree, uh, because the effort is big. Debugging takes a lifetime. And uh, if we can save time uh, in some way, that would be so helpful. Uh, Michael Franklach, Berkeley. Good coverage, good, uh, you know, uh, very nice. Uh, I just want to comment on uh, kind of one thing you touched, comparing re theory results to experiment. Mm -hmm. And there is a big can of worms there that people need to be aware. One is, even like in, in best estimate, let's say accurate kinetics, factor of two for eight constant, you have 10 of them, you have humongous space of uncertainty, right? So the model will not be automatically predictive. Now, of course, people are doing kind of following what maybe I started 40 years ago, let's do optimization. But they're overdoing it, I'm sorry to say looking for kind of magical point by optimization in this huge space, it's a mistake. And I know we have whole section going talking about it. And, you know, okay, I better not, not attend and not to say anything. Yeah. So, but, but this is the one concern that need, need, needs to be really uh, clearly expressed. I liked one point in your slide where you said you do comparison and when you don't agree, you go back to theory, not to... Uh, you know, uh, deep learning and so on that can magically find your solutions which don't exist. The second point that I want to say, you had a graph there comparing a theory to experiment to, in, and you mentioned like ignition delay time. Mm -hmm. You didn't pose uh, a unit there, right? But what I want to point out is that experiments, including shock tube, which supposedly very accurate, and I did those, I was one of those, uh, the accuracy is overestimated. Uh, so when we needed an approximately fine thing, it was great. Now when we talk about factor of two, accuracy of shock tube need to be rolled into the big question mark analysis. Short time scale are very wrong be, be, because they, I mean short ignition delay times are hard to, to measure. Long ignition delay time, like above half a millisecond, are usually compound by gas dynamics effect. You don't measure any more chemistry. So comparing just theory to uh, those experiments, I would try theory more today for, let's say, long ignition delay time than, than experiments. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with uh, m most of what you said. Uh, yeah, well, one thing that can happen with, uh, with optimization is that uh, you do the optimization of the rate constant uh, over the experimental data, then you do calculations at uh, a higher level of theory, and you go in the opposite direction of where optimization was going. And uh, so uh, it's absolutely true. You need to find the, the, the right uh, set of experimental data with the right type of uncertainty in order uh, to try to match uh, theory, theory and experiment. Uh, I like, uh, for example, in trying to um, understand my 
my, 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 my data, uh, my calculations, uh, to um, compare uh, the predictions with very different experimental setups. So, uh, for example, I've done these studies on non adiabatic reaction with atomic oxygen plus unsaturated stuff. And uh, uh, I look, I'm happy when I can look at cross molecular beams on one side and kinetic experiments such as uh, uh, the photoionization uh, uh, studies done by Etzandia. So, and if I can uh, match the two, then uh, immediately it emerges, for example, that some. Uh, some uncertainties that you have in one experiment and in another one uh, are not consistent, for example. And the model maybe is in, the in between. So this helps to, uh, a lot to, to, uh, to understand uh, if you are on the right track or not. We're, we're over time now, so we'll take one last question from you. Uh, Alessio, Fra Soldati, Politecnico Milano. Uh, it's more a general comment. Uh, my feeling is that we have a large source of uncertainty in the mechanism. Uh, and this source of uncertainty is hidden inside the uh, third body efficiencies. So we typically don't pay too, uh, sufficient attention to, to this point. Uh, there is a, a recent paper by Alexander Conov that shows how CO2 efficiency in a given reaction, which is made on the composition, is affecting the laminar for LP. Um, so in the development of automatic rate constant estimation and mechanism, uh, this is typically a uh, point that is overlooked. Also because we are restricted by the uh, P-log standard Kenkin uh, format, and Klippenstein, uh, Stephen, or knows this point uh, very clearly. And so the more we introduce uh, P-log, because we want to be more accurate, we are taking third body efficiencies effect out of the kinetic mechanism. And so I don't know how the theory, I know that Jasper and other authors are working on the, uh, on the theoretical uh, estimation of uh, these efficiencies, but then we cannot uh, translate this knowledge inside the kinetic mechanism. Yeah, yeah, w we are working on that. So, uh, for example, the 2D master equation I was talking about and uh, Arin Jasper work is really on to that. Uh, we are uh, cooperating with Mike Burke also to update open smokes. They can take into account uh, the log P formats for different colliders and then come up with mixture rules that are appropriate uh, to describe the effect of the different colliders. Also, uh, in uh, um, relation to the constraint coming from the master equation. But apart from the fact that we are working on that, uh, it's uh, good that you pointed out because um, we, we are in this situation where we produce uh, uh, a lot of uh, high quality theoretical data uh, but uh, uh, a lot of rate constant have been determined in argon, bath, bagasse. Uh, and then we introduce them in the kinetic mechanism, maybe replacing the rate constant that had a third body efficiency, and the third body efficiency is gone. And so uh, the mechanism that was accounting for the uh, efficient of the colliding part, now it doesn't have it anymore. So we are in this intermediate period where uh, uh, we are getting better on one side and worse on the other. We, we need to complete the, to finish the job <laughs> and <laughs> get back to where we were at the start, uh, maybe even better, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs>